So now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, which is, as I'm flipping around, Carl Etzel, which is, uh, who is already standing up here. So Carl has worked in the Silicon Valley tech industry for 17 years, following five years as, as an officer and nuclear engineer in the US Navy. He began studying and using heart rate-based training methods as an endurance athlete in the early 1990s as First Beats representative in North America for their OEM wellness business lines. He has a unique perspective on how heart rate variability is being deployed today and where it is headed in the future. Please welcome Carl Etzel. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, uh, Randy, and thanks for the chance to speak. So yeah, um, my journey here started, uh, started way back in the early 90s when I was a cyclist and started using, uh, using a heart rate monitor to track, uh, track my training and became really interested in, in this. This was back before we called them wearables. We just called them heart rate monitors. Uh, I took a few years off from cycling, and when I came back, they had become wearables, but, uh, but same technology. And then uh, a few years ago, I started hearing about heart rate variability which is what got me connected with First Beat and what brought me here tonight. Um, so I'm going to give kind of an overview of the background of heart rate variability. I'll talk a little bit about where it is in the market and, uh, and I think some cool things that are, that are being done with it today. So um, it's a pretty uh, broad presentation I'll give tonight, but uh, just very, very brief background on what we do at First Beat. We're basically a physiology company. We started about 15 years ago. We build models of human physiology and we turn heart rate data into something actionable. So if you've ever used a heart rate monitor, you might know that just staring at the numbers, unless you have a really good intuition and you really spend a lot of time with it, it doesn't tell you a lot. Knowing that your average heart rate was 143 doesn't mean much. Knowing that you spent a certain amount of time in zones may not even mean a lot to you. And so what we do is we try to make that more actionable. And we build models of human physiology, and then we deploy them to professional sports teams. We work with a few of the locals, the Golden State Warriors and the Sharks. Um, we also license that technology into consumer products. If you've got a Garmin device or a Sunto, you've probably used our products or our technology. And then we work with corporate wellness programs. So that's kind of the background on, on what we do and, and how I got into this. So um, what is heart rate variability? I'll just talk about some of the basics and uh, get into a little bit of the mathematics behind how we analyze it. But um, most people are very familiar and, and understand the simple concept of heart rate, right? You know, beats per minute. Variability looks at the actual change in that heartbeat, right? So if you just feel your pulse, you'll notice this. You'll notice your heart is not a metronome. It speeds up and it slows down. While you're sitting here at rest, that's predominantly driven by, uh, by your respiration rate. And you can even try it. You can hold your breath and then you can breathe real fast. You'll notice it'll go up on the inhales and tend to settle down on the exhales. The theory there is that your body actually knows to adjust your heart rate based on the amount of oxygen available in the lungs. No point beating away to pump blood that isn't highly oxygenated. So heart rate variability is interesting because it turns out that within that variation, okay, within the differences between the timing between beats, there's a lot of information and insight about the state of your nervous system. And this is what we use to sort of derive a lot of really interesting and increasingly actionable information when it comes to sports training, when it comes to stress management, and, and a handful of other things that I think are, are pretty interesting. Um, so let's talk about a few of the technical details. So um, what I've shown up here is an ECG trace. It turns out that a lot of the consumer wearable devices today are not using ECG. They're using what's called PPG, which is a mouthful. It's photoplethysmography, which is basically how they, when they determine heart rate by shining a light through your skin and they look at the volumetric changes in the blood vessels. And if you watch that variation over time, you know that the variation in the volume of blood is matched to your heart rate. So you can actually, in some of the newer devices and the more accurate ones, you can actually determine this beat-to-beat -beat timing and therefore the difference in beat-to-beat -beat timing even off of the PPG. But ECG is kind of the gold standard. Um, the, the way you can calculate HRV, there's a lot of different mathematical uh, tools that are used or different mathematical formulas that are used to analyze it. Probably the most popular one is what's called RMSSD. It stands for root mean square of successive differences. Uh, you can see why nobody markets or very few people market their product uh, on RMSSD, although you will find that actually in a handful of products. Um, in fact, the one this gentleman's wearing right here, which I'm also wearing, is the Aura Ring. If you pull up the little app that describes this is a smart device, 
Uh, it tracks heart rate. It's a sleep tracker. It tracks a few other things as well. It'll actually tell you that it's doing RMSST. Um, but uh, there's a handful of mobile apps as well, and I'll reference a few of those in a minute that, uh, that do this. So that's really the, the measure of heart rate variability and, uh, and what it's all about. So a few other ways to look at RMSSD. So you can measure it in time domain. Uh, SDNN is standard deviation. AVNN is average variation. You can also do uh, frequency domain analysis. So quick, uh, quick refresher on math for those of you that don't think about Fourier transforms regularly. If you take any time varying signal, okay, any signal you want, you can take that signal, maybe smooth, it may be really bouncy, and you can break it down as a summation of a bunch of individual signals at discrete frequencies. Okay? So you can represent it as a series of sums of sine waves. And each of those sine waves at a unique frequency has an amplitude associated with it. Right? And then you take those amplitudes and you plot them over frequency, and you get a plot that looks like that. Okay? So what you see here is, and I apologize, the, the numbers are a little grainy, but you just see the frequency range. And then you get uh, PSD, uh, power or something distribution. Um, yeah, uh, so that's basically how much energy or how much of the wave is concentrated in those frequency bands. Okay, so a really good example of this, in fact, one that I stumbled across the other day, uh, is temperature variation. If you go to weather.com, you can see a little plot of the temperature in your neighborhood. And what does it do? It does this on a cycle of 24 hours. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. But if you look at that fluctuation, it may also be all those variations may be rising as a heat front comes in and then falling as a cold front comes in. Okay? That's a different frequency signal. So in a frequency plot, if you did the Fourier transform of your temperature, that would show up as a lower frequency spike. And then you could plot that out over many years and extend the curve further to the left to even lower frequencies and watch the amplitude of the variation over years. Okay? Yeah, exactly. Sunspot cycles, right? And so you can go really low in frequency and you can go really high in frequency, okay, uh, in these variations. And so you can imagine how if you play that out, that gives you really powerful analysis tools for any signal. We do the same thing with heart rate variability, and it turns out that um, what we've seen over time is that there's kind of two major bands that we tend to talk about, low and high frequency, and then um, a VLF and sometimes higher frequency signals. The main one that reflects... Um, sort of the, the uh, parasympathetic nervous system activity is this higher frequency variation. So that's higher frequency, which means a shorter time period, and that is what gets matched more closely to your breathing rate, okay? So what happens is when you're really relaxed and your parasympathetic nervous system, and I'll define that in just a minute, when that's active, you'll see more energy up here, okay? If you go out and start running around the block, what happens? So let me go back to sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is what is often called uh, fight or flight. Parasympathetic is what's called rest and digest, right? That's what's basically governing your body when you're in recovery mode, particularly when you're sleeping. But even as you're all sitting here right now, you're probably parasympathetically dominated, right? Except for me, because I'm speaking and you're watching me, so I'm a little more sympathetically dominated, right? But, um, but that's what drives the higher frequency. And so if you get up and go run around the block, your heart rate's going to respond. The, the, the low frequency is going to start to dominate, OK? And this is one of the things that we do at First Beat is we, we analyze both HRV and heart rate and activity and put all that together into something more meaningful, right? It turns out that just like with heart rate, you kind of need to know some other stuff that's going on to really figure out what it means. Anyways. So that's, uh, so that's what we do. So that's one of the things, if you go do research, if you just start Googling around and looking up heart rate variability, you'll often hear a discussion of frequency domain analysis, and that's what's going on. Uh, and finally, just like with heart rate, it varies within and between individuals, right? So just like uh, a heart rate of 140 for me isn't the same as a heart rate of 140 for the next person for a workout, same is true with heart rate variability, right? Mine may hang out at, well, I know mine hangs out at around 50 to 60 every night. Um, the next person's might hang out at 70 or 80 every night, okay? And so when you try to use that to assess fatigue or stress or recovery, you've got a baseline off of that just like you would with heart rate. 
Uh, let's see. Okay, a couple of applications of HRV or things that it's been used for. So most books are probably familiar with the Framingham study, a big longitudinal study uh, of health and wellness over a long period of time. Turns out HRV was found to be one of the um, most highly correlated parameters with uh, impending mortality. So uh, if your heart starts to act just like a metronome, probably bad news. Um, endurance training. This was actually where first beat got its start. The first question we tried to answer as a company uh, was, can you predict overtraining in athletes? Right? So can you predict that an athlete is about to overdo it and get sick or have a higher injury propensity? Um, and so they've done some studies with marathon runners. They took groups of marathon runners, and they had some of them just follow a set training program, and then some of them follow a training program that was modulated by HRV, where when the HRV drops, they take an easy day. When the HRV is high, they do their hard days. Those that were HRV modulated uh, performed notably better. So in terms of you know, staging your workouts and your training over time, it can be a pretty powerful number for that. Um, and finally, uh, in sort of the wellness space. So I've talked a little bit about stress and, and parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Um, they've done some studies to show really good correlation between HRV and subjective stress. The other main, stress is kind of an interesting thing. It's a number that, or a word that everybody's familiar with. Most folks have some intuitive understanding of it. It's actually not really precisely defined from a scientific standpoint. Um, if you contrast it a little bit with cardiovascular fitness, if you ask 10 physiologists what's the measure of cardiovascular fitness, all 10 are probably going to tell you VO2 max, right? It's a pretty well-defined number. It's milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body mass per minute, and everybody will just recite that. Stress is a little different, right? Um, HRV is one key thing people will use. The other is cortisol. Um, you can do cortisol tests either by blood or by saliva. Um, I've done both. And they're, um, they're very useful, uh, but a little bit invasive and difficult to do, and actually um, don't correlate quite as well with subjective stress uh, in some of the studies as HRV. So anyways. OK. So that's kind of a little bit of science background and application background. I'll give you a little bit of market perspective. So um, here in Silicon Valley, of course, Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm, pretty popular book. A lot of folks are familiar with this. It's this technology adoption curve that you see up here on the top right. So in any technology adoption, you get the enthusiasts, the visionaries, and then between visionaries and pragmatists, there's kind of this chasm. Marketers, one of the things more observed is that marketers make this mistake of thinking you're just going to sail smoothly from the early adopters right into this majority and, and scale your business. And what kept happening was companies kept dying in the chasm. Um, and I think where we're at with HRV is kind of we're in this interesting place where I think we're ramping up to get over the chasm, uh, potentially. Um, when you start, start seeing articles in places like the Wall Street Journal uh, and Outside Magazine, um, you, know, you know you're getting out into the mainstream. And, um, and I think that the improvement, a bunch of things are driving that. One is the improvement in the, uh, the analytics to make it easier for people to understand. Better sensor technology, right? You no longer have to be wearing a heart rate strap to do this. Um, that device there is the Garmin Vivo, Vivo Smart uh, that actually has real-time stress monitoring on the wrist using the PPG, the optical sensor. Uh, those are icons over there from a couple of apps. I think Sweet Beats, HRV for training, and Elite HRV um, that you can just go get in the app store and either use, some of them actually use the camera in the phone if you're lying really still with it on your chest or on your arm, uh, it can pick up the, the heartbeat. Uh, or you can just go buy a, a Bluetooth heart rate strap and use them with that. Um, so you know we're getting to that point where there's a growing awareness, and, and it's a lot easier to do. I actually had a, I have a, both, both of my sons are pretty into sports, and of course I, I kind of got them that way. But uh, my 11-year-old, when he was 10, did his science fair project doing on HRV. And he just did it with a free app from iTunes and a heart rate strap I bought down at the bike shop. And he was able to plot out HRV and, and look at that as a function of correlated with his, with his training. So um, when 10-year-old kids can do it for science projects and you can go down to REI and, and buy a device off the shelf, you know, it's getting ready to go a little more mainstream. So that's kind of a little bit of market perspective. Um, I've talked a little bit about the, the sports application. Uh, one of the other areas where we've seen, I think, some interesting work is HRV and meditation. 
So it turns out that this ability to, you actually can, can do things consciously to modulate your, your heart rate variability. And some of the people who are best at that are people who are really good at meditating. Um, they've done some studies with, you know, with Buddhist monks and, and others who are just really good at getting their mind in the right place and driving their HRV up. <laughs> and you can actually teach yourself this as well. Um, this is one of the apps, Relaxing Rhythms, that actually uses HRV biofeedback during the meditation process. There's, there's quite a few meditation apps out there right now. Um, Headspace is another really popular one. Uh, Calm is another one that you'll hear a lot about. I don't think either of them uses biofeedback, but, uh, but it's an interesting interplay between meditation as a way to modulate stress and actually drive up heart rate variability. Of course, the corporate world is catching on to this. If you follow the you know, Business Insider and some of the other uh, you know, news channels, it seems like every day another CEO is talking about how meditation helps them deal with the stress of being a CEO. Um, you know, Mark Benioff, Ray Dalio, a big hedge funder, uh, Oprah, a bunch of others. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot going on, I think, in this space. And this is, I think, another one of those places where if you think about sort of driving this into the corporate wellness world, which is a lot of what we do at First Beat, I think that, um, you know, I sort, of, I sort of compare it to back when the iPhone first came out. iPhones got, and Apple to some degree got their nose under the tent in corporate IT with the iPhone and the executives. It was like the cool thing to have, right? In fact, I was working at Intel in the digital health group there at the time, and I remember, you know, our VP was like one of the first guys with an iPhone, and he was arm wrestling with IT to get them to, to accept it. I think this is going to be another sort of uh, the camel's nose under the tent in terms of meditation and HRV into, uh, into corporate wellness. So a couple of other places where that shows up, I mean, a number of companies are doing this. We do it at First Beat. Um, Fitbit, of course, is making a big, uh, a big push into corporate wellness. Um, Lumotech, another local Bay Area company. I think they're right down the road in Mountain View, actually. Um, Samsung and, and a host of others. Um, I just saw actually a report that came out today uh, National Health Business Group said 37% of companies are using wearables in some fashion in their wellness programs, and about another 35 to 40% are planning to do so within the next few years. So really good adoption by corporations, right? Um, this has been going on for a while. We went through sort of a first few early phases of it where it was just hand out devices and hope people do something with them. Um, I think all the companies are getting into a place where they're going to be delivering a lot more actionable information. Um, and when you look at how many ways stress impacts on people uh, and how much impact that has in the workplace, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, we've seen it in, in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, HRV is a really good indicator of, uh, of sleep quality and, and stress reco and recovery. So we've seen companies using this for shift workers who are operating heavy equipment, and they really want to know those guys are well rested before they operate heavy machinery. We see companies that do it with executives who are, you know, living in hotels 200 nights a year and their sleep's all messed up and they don't know what time zone they're in um, and, and everything in between, right? So for companies, there's, you know, a pretty nice ROI if you can knock down absenteeism or accidents or whatever. Um, so those are a couple of the different use cases we're seeing for this. Uh, I just saw another report actually the other day as well, uh, big ties between stress and cholesterol levels actually. Right, so, um, you know, cholesterol um, doesn't have quite as bad a name as it used to have. Certainly dietary cholesterol doesn't, but, um, but you've still got to watch it, and it turns out it's linked up very much with inflammation, which is also linked up a lot with stress. So tools like this that can help people manage that, I think, are, are getting more and more interesting in the corporate wellness setting. So finally, just uh, I'll share a few thoughts on wearables. Um, you know, I, I mentioned when I started with all this, you know, it was, it was a heart rate monitor, which meant, you know, pretty much one form factor, a, a strap that goes around your chest and a thing that goes on your wrist. There's still a lot of those out there, but um, we're seeing a lot of different form factors today. I mentioned the ring that I'm wearing. There's a, there's a few others on the market as well. Um, up there in the top are the, the Jabra earbuds. They do heart rate sensing in the ear. Turns out the ear is a pretty good place to measure heart rate uh, variability because you get some skin that's fairly thin, so you can get light through it pretty well, and you can get a nice tight fit. So um, I actually didn't think I was going to love those, but I totally love them. It's the coolest thing to pop in an earbud and have my heart rate pop up on my phone. 
um, doing uh, heart rate monitoring with a headband, right? So uh, that's interesting, but where I think that gets even more interesting is there's an awful lot of sports where you're wearing a helmet, right? So I think eventually we'll get the heart rate monitoring actually in the helmet. Um, the armband is actually just another, another optical sensor, only instead of putting it down on the wrist, they just put it up on the arm. You can actually pretty easily imagine why that, that works well, right? Your wrist is kind of bony. It's got this big protrusion. One of the big challenges in getting good data off the wrist is just the form factor, right? Just getting a thing that sits really comfortably and consistently on the wrist and doesn't pop up or bounce around. Um, so putting the band up there on the arm uh, apparently works, works pretty well. Uh, some of these others, uh, the Lumo, I think this one is the Lumotech. Um, they're doing a, a run sensing system. This is another local company, Athos. Uh, heart rate comes along for the ride with these guys. They're doing EMG, so electromyography, which is measuring the electrical signals to your muscles. Okay, turns out this is a pretty interesting thing to measure if you're an athlete and you're lifting weights or you're trying to do really anything. Um, you can look at muscle pattern coordination, right? I actually did that uh, when I was racing bikes. Um, I, I had an EMG on while I was pedaling, and I could see the different muscles in my legs firing throughout the pedal stroke, right? And I had a coach telling me which muscles to fire at which point in the stroke. And then I would go out and ride that way for six hours at a time. Um, that was what I used to do for fun. Uh, but, you know, you can imagine, right, there's all kinds of things you can do with that, right? We're seeing... Um, You've been to the, the gym probably where they have treadmills and you can just grab a hold of, of the thing and it'll tell you your heart rate. Well, you can imagine embedding that in things like baseball bats and golf clubs, right? And in fact, there's people doing motion sensing for those sports, so you can see where those are gonna link up. We've actually had conversations with people doing, um, I think Toyota at one point was trying to put them in steering wheels, right? So we've had some interesting conversations about stress and driver fatigue and driver safety. It's a little bit hard because people don't always hold the steering wheel really consistently all the time, right? Especially if you're tired, one hand's kind of draped over the armrest and one hand, you know. But um, you can start to see how, you know, this pops up in a lot of different places. Uh, and then, you know, wearables again, footbeds. Uh, if you're a runner, you can buy instrumented footbeds that'll tell you how your foot's striking the ground, tell you that your shoes are worn out, tell you that your left foot hits this way, your right foot hits that way. So wearables are sort of blowing up into a lot of different things. Um, and I think if you go even beyond biometrics, um, we're seeing this a little bit in, in corporate wellness and even on the consumer side, adding other features in with wearables. So there's a company doing a uh, authentication device with the ring. So the ring becomes your identity device, right? When you go to the, when you go to the turnstile on the subway, you just put your hand on the thing and you keep going. You know, you can imagine the pay, you know, it was a big deal to do payment on your phone and do payment on the ring. Right? Just put your hand up there and it knows who you are and you've paid. And you can imagine embedding all kinds of identity information into that. There's a question? It's not in the Apple Watch. What, what's it's the not question? in the Apple Watch. What? It's wearable. Is, is what in the Apple Watch? Uh, I'm not sure if the Apple Watch is... Uh, so the question was, is heart rate variability in the Apple Watch? Uh, I think there are apps in the watch that are tracking it. I'm actually not sure. That's one of the... One of the devices I haven't played with much yet. I'd be surprised if there are not actually at this point. Um, as long as the data quality is good, you know, they'd be able to do. I mean, they are doing heart rate tracking. So, um, so that was kind of it. Um, that was all I had. Uh, like I said, it's sort of a broad overview. Didn't try not to go too deep on any one thing. And uh, I'll take questions. Hi, I'm using the Polar with the SweetBeat app on my iPhone. And when I'm walking, I synchronize my breathing, like three steps in, breathing and mm. exhaling uh, six steps. And I could see the modulation from the breathing even when I'm walking. Mm. And what does that really say very much? Um, and also, the HRV numbers I'm getting when I'm resting are really low, but I'm 75, so maybe that says, mm -hmm. is there an age-related HRV? Mm. Yeah, so great questions. Uh, so what is it, when you're doing physical activity actually, so walking is kind of in the, in the boundary, right? It's not really intense. 
So as you go, as you go. It's 120. It is. Oh, okay. Okay. So you're not just out for a stroll. No, I'm, yeah. I'm walking hard. Yeah. Okay. So at that point, I mean, you shouldn't, your, your HRV should be low actually at that point. Right. So that's where. Yeah. This, yeah. It's very small amplitude. Yep. So sympathetic. Yeah. It's very small amplitude. Yeah. So sympathetic nervous system is dominating, right? That's responding to the sort of macro load on your body to pump enough blood to feed your muscles. And it's not, your heart's not worrying about bouncing up and down a little bit with how much oxygen is in your but lungs. But it still goes down when I'm breathing. It's the same yeah. pattern, just smaller amplitude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's probably a good sign, actually, then, right? That it is, actually. I, don't I mean, know. It, means that you're, I don't know. it means that you're able to maintain some of that. It means you're not completely pegged out, you know, at, just at that pace. I do breathe through my nose only, so I don't, I keep my carbon dioxide level up as high as possible <laughs> yeah. in order to open up all the arteries. Okay. Okay. Actually, well, no, nose breathing is actually, can be, if you train with it, it can become really efficient. Uh, I, I spent a few years doing that. Efficient or inefficient? E efficient. 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 I, I, um, yeah, there's a really good book on the topic uh, by a guy named John Duyard, uh, Body, Mind, and Sport, uh, which I would recommend. I, this was like one of the super influential books for me. And this guy was adamant that you could like go at race pace, nose breathing. And I said, that's crazy. You can't go race pace, nose breathing. And so I started doing this, and I got to where I was riding my bike up Old La Honda Road with my heart rate at 178, nose breathing. If you had told me that, I would have said, so that's it, insane. It's like oxygen deprivation then, right? No, it, you, get, you get plenty of oxygen. I mean, I was through, doing this steady nose state. Nose breathing? Nose breathing, yes. Yeah, yeah. It turns out that nose breathing is actually a really good way to calm yourself. Humans are what's called obligate nose breathers. In other words, we breathe through our mouths only when we have to. Um, other animals aren't like that, but we actually really want to breathe through our noses. It's only through bad habit that we start breathing through our mouths. So your mind actually responds to that, and if you start breathing through your mouth, it thinks you're under stress, right? It thinks you're panicking and trying to outrun a saber-toothed tiger. And so it turns out that if you train yourself to nose breathe, it keeps you calmer. And I, I never would have believed I would, I would ride like that. But Could you mention the age relation? Oh, sorry, yeah, the age relationship. Um, that's a great question that has never come up. I mean, I know heart rate good drops with age, right? Peak heart rate drops with age. I certainly noticed it. Because <laughs> uh, I'd go to the hospital if I, I did what I used to. Um, I don't know about variability. I would suppose that it declines with age, but yeah, that's, that's a good question. Okay, there were hands up here, okay. There's a lot of research now on heart rate variability and uh, heart disease and vagal tone, the vagus mm -hmm. nerve mm -hmm. tone of it. Um, and it has to do probably with your question earlier um, about age, because as we age with all the changes in our bodies and declines of hormones and everything, we tend to, um, everything goes down, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, But exercise helps keep it up, but optimal for whatever physiologically you can do. Um, are, is your work here being used in medical settings for people with heart disease? Because heart rate variability has been connected with um, heart attacks and heart failure, mm -hmm. a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, specifically with our work at First Beat, we haven't. We've actually sort of stayed out of the medical regulated world and just stayed in the health and wellness. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we sometimes sort of butt up against it, <laughs> but, uh, but we've stayed out of that. Yeah, well, for this group here, it's high interest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, um, I saw some, uh, it's quite a bit of research actually been funded by the sports associations with head injuries, head traumas, because mm. heart rate variability goes down after head traumas. And sports with children, um, say football and soccer oh, for girls. And um, what was one more? Um, well, anyway, there's a lot of research at PubMed on it. And so I've been studying this recently just to try, and it's good to know you of these devices so we could tell our patients, go ahead and uh, get a device to help help you uh, do that. The interesting for, thing for me is I used to be a, a, a Hatha yoga and meditation teacher, and to see the research that's come out now on heart rate variability, and the most common things you can do are all the yogic practices, which I find fascinating yeah. not just meditation but yoga and all mm -hmm. the different breathing practices and humming 
chanting, yeah. all those yeah, yeah. things. Great. No, that, that's so. Thanks for the heads up on concussion. That's one I hadn't come across, and, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think it's really fascinating how these ancient practices are coming back in vogue. You know, the other one is fasting, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, I remember listening to a podcast one day, and they were talking to some guys who were doing fasting, and one of the guys said, "Yeah, one guy even did a 40-day fast," <laughs> and I thought, "40-day fast? Have I ever heard of that?" <laughs> you know, uh, that sounds vaguely familiar. You know. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the science come back around on a lot of that stuff. Okay, any other questions? We're back here, okay. Can you talk a little bit about your monitor on your ring? Oh, sure. What the manufacturer is and uh, what it provides you? Yeah, so uh, the company's called Aura. Uh, it's uh, another Finland company, first beats a Finnish company. Finland is kind of like this hothouse of development in the heart rate analytics uh, and monitoring and wearable world. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's called the Aura Ring, uh, O-U-R-A. It's a startup. I think they did it as a Kickstarter project uh, a while back. It started shipping a few months ago. It tracks, uh, it's got accelerometer, it tracks heart rate. It does some kind of pulse wave analysis as well that sort of is embedded in their analytics. Uh, it winds up being mostly, and it does heart rate. Temperature. And temperature, yeah, that's right. And I think it may do GSR, galvanic skin. No, no it doesn't? Okay, just temp. Um, I use it mostly as a sleep tracker. I actually got it for sleep tracking, and I was really excited because I thought it would do heart rate during my, I do Bikram yoga, which if you've ever done, B, it's 90 minutes in a 105 degree room. I mean, and I don't like wearing a strap, but it doesn't do heart rate during the day, so I was bummed about that. Um, but it's a good sleep tracker. They just added HRV at night, not in the... About a month ago, HRV yeah. and night is coming out. Yeah. yeah. There's a few others. Motive is another one, another watch. And I think, uh, I think those are the two that I've seen the most of. I have a question. Um, with the potential application for the steering wheel, was the idea mm -hmm. behind that so that maybe it could be all the way around it, was so that it, your car could then tell you you're too tired to drive? Yeah. That's the Something idea. like that, yeah. That was okay. the idea. I don't know how far they got with it, but uh, but yeah, it was it was fatigue. Right. Or you do yeah. not have good taste in music. <laughs> Something like that. You can settle the channel. debate with your, yeah. with your significant other. <laughs> right. That would be valuable. Okay. Uh, oh, one more back here. Okay. Just a quick question about your aura ring. What uh, technology does it use to sense the heart rate? Is it the same light sensor? Yeah, that it's an optical. Oh. Yep. Okay. I, yeah, I think that's about it. Please thank Carl. Yeah. All right. So that concludes our meeting tonight. I hope you, we'll see you all next time. Thank you. <laughs>